there is Jude and then Revelation. So we're looking for 1 John in chapter 4 and verse 8. We're going to look at that verse here in just a moment. We'll let you get those two places, get your notes all set up and ready to go. But once you've found that, once you've found that, then we're going to do something else tonight. So you put something in Galatians and put something in 1 John. Then I want you to go back with me to the book of Psalms. All right, you say, Pastor, I'm running out of fingers here. All right, well, this will be the last place we go for here. So Psalm 100, uh, 118, Psalm 118 tonight. Now, we are on the, and verse 9, Psalm 118 and verse 9. And we are, of course, on the eve of a national election. I know many folks have already voted absentee. Uh, they've voted, been voting in very different things. I'm glad we finally uh, kind of gotten the, uh, the idea that I believe there are 250 or 280 million people in America. We can't all vote logistically on one day. And I'm certainly glad for the democratic process uh, that they've finally gotten an idea that uh, we need to have different avenues for people to vote uh, as long as those voting avenues are secure and they are uh, counted. Amen? Um, but we're on the eve of election and I know a lot of people are concerned. A lot of people are uh, even perplexed and uh, you say, Pastor, what do we do about that? And uh, I certainly don't want anyone, uh, I, this is not, you will never, at least while I'm the pastor, have a lot of politics from the pulpit. Uh, pl trust me, God put plenty of material in here to keep me busy a long time, even with four full services a week. Uh, but I would not denigrate, uh, this is called, a, uh, the pastors call this a sacred desk right here. The pulpit is a place where a man of God opens the word of God and says, thus saith God, amen? And uh, I, I take, make no claims to be a prophet, uh, but I do claim to be be a man called of God and one day God did call me he called me to be a preacher and called me to open his word and faithfully preach his word and that's what I've endeavored to do for these last 20 some odd years uh, but I never want anyone to um, there is a you will notice if you've been here long enough a particular lack of politics from this pulpit and we will keep it that way uh, we rally around one person the blessed and only potentate that's the Lord Jesus Christ amen I want everyone uh, no matter your political affiliation I want you uh, I want everyone to walk in these doors to feel welcome no matter what, where they come from who they are their political affiliation look if they're saved they're washed in the blood and they love Jesus they're welcome here amen Amen. All right. If you didn't know that, you do now. Now, <clears throat> I never want to, though, to, to uh, um, give the uh, impression that uh, I'm, I'm blasé or, or casual about my country. I love my country. I've had the opportunity to have traveled. Uh, I only have about uh, 1,800 miles from... Um, from New Delhi all the way over to Beijing and I've been all the way around the world I went east one time went west one time I only have a short gap uh, and I've been all the way around the world been on several continents and uh, been in a number of different countries and there's no place like America I can speak to that there is no place with all of her faults and all of her problems and all of her issues no place like America I love my country I am very passionate about my country and I am very involved in my country but as a Christian I'm biblical in my focus. You say, Pastor, what's your perspective on the election? Because who knows? Uh, God knows how the election's going uh, to go. And by the way, God's still in control no matter which way the election's going to go. But let me give you a biblical perspective to help you as we go through these. Uh, as we, by the way, uh, this coming Sunday night, I'll be preaching on hope. What is our hope? Let me tell you something. Our hope is not who's in the White House. That's a true statement. Our hope is not who's in the White House. There's a far greater hope of the Christian. But I want you to go to Psalm 118 tonight in verse 9. This has nothing to do with the lesson. I just want to give this to you. Notice what the Bible has to say. This is a biblical perspective on these kinds of things. It is, what's that next word? Better. To trust in the who? The Lord. Than to put confidence in man. Listen, it's better to put our confidence in in you know what i read the wrong verse did i i, it, I, I read i read the verse eight it says well, look at it uh, in verse eight it says it is better to put your trust in the lord than to put confidence in man look at verse nine that's the verse nine is what i was going for it is better to trust in the lord than to put confidence in princes i read that and i'm like well that's not what i wrote down <laughs> or not the verse i wanted now in the bible the word prince means an official a a, 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 um, a leader, all right? They, they didn't have elected people back then. They had kings and they had princes and princesses and all those things. And a prince is a political 
power or person. Now, in verse 8, it says it's better to put your trust in the Lord and put it in man. We'd all agree with that. But listen, you say, well, Pastor, what's your, what's your take on the elections and on political this and that? Uh, verse 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. You say, where's your confidence? It's not in the White House. Can I say I'm certainly happy for our Supreme Court and, and, and the, the direction it's taken, but my confidence is not in the Supreme Court. My confidence is in the supreme being, the Lord. Amen. Now go to one other place. You say, well, why would the Lord make that statement? It's better to put your confidence in the Lord than man. It's better to put your confidence in the Lord than any kind of leadership, princes, what the Bible say. Well, the, God will tell us. Look at Psalm. You're in the book of Psalms. Go, to, go over to Psalm 146. 146 and verse 3. See, the Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. The Bible is the best teacher of the Bible. If you let the Bible explain the Bible, it clears up all doubts. Look at Psalm 146 and verse 3. Why would God say that in Psalm 118? Because in Psalm 146 and verse 3, it says this, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Now look at verse 5. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now why is that? Look at verse 6. Which made heaven and earth and the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseneth the prisoner. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. And he goes on and on and on. You know why? Because uh, in, in verse 3, it says this, there's very little help in mankind. There is very little help in political powers and office. Uh, listen, politics and politicians come and go, but God remains. And listen, if you're looking for somebody who has the answers, somebody who has the power, somebody who has the ability to truly make a difference, hey, that's God. Listen, it's God who made the earth and God who made the sea and God who made the clouds and God who made the world. I, can you tell it's going to be a good night? Amen. I'm fired up for Jesus. Listen. My friends, I do vote. I've, I've only missed one election. It was an off-year election it's because I moved from uh, Mogador, Ohio to Kent, Ohio, and I did not have time to register to vote. But I have voted in every single election, both uh, a presidential and off-year since the day since the, I turned 18 years of old, age. I am very engaged. My mayor knows who I am. I've, I've written to my president, so multiple of them, my, my mayor, my governors, uh, my senators, my congressmen, and I do pray for them. And I do contact them, and I do email them, sometimes regularly. And I do voice my, con my concerns and my opinions. I am a United States citizen, and I think every citizen ought to be very engaged. By the way, listen, if every born-again Christian who, who, who loves the Lord and knows God would get out and vote on Tuesday, America would be a better place. Listen, but my hope, my security, my confidence is not in a man. It's in God. Okay, so rest in that. Don't fear. Don't worry about uh, what's going to happen. Listen, uh, let, me just, let me just shortcut to the end. It's all going to fall apart, and Jesus is going to come back together. Gant, Jesus is going to come back, and it's all going to get better. Okay? I'll just, I just shortcut through a whole lot of history. Now, that's just a little primer tonight uh, about where Pastor Rob stands on the elections and politics and all those different things. It wasn't a part of the message. I just thought I'd throw that in for free. That's a Wednesday night bonus because you came to Bible study. Glory to God. Now, let's go back to uh, the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians chapter 5. We're in. The, a study of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we lay down uh, an introductory message on who the Holy Spirit is, what the works of the Holy Spirit are, uh, what his gifts are, and, and, and an introduction of how he works. And, and through that, last week, we took time to understand from the Bible what, love, what the word and the concept of love really means. Uh, we discover, we discuss the fact that in our English language, we, we can say, I love ice cream, and that's true. I love pizza, and that's true. But I also love Jesus, and, and, and there's a scale there. I, I should love Jesus a whole lot more than I love Almond Joy candy bars, all right, and Kit Kats, and all those other good candy bars that are out there. 
We looked at the, some of the biblical language to understand that uh, there is in the Greek language, there's different words, some that talk about a, a physical attraction and some that talk about uh, an emotional attraction, but some, one word in particular, agape, godly love, the kind of love that God is and the kind of love that God gives. And we learned about what that kind of love is. So when the Christian and the Bible talks about love we're talking about a godly love and a godlike love and so that's the foundation we've laid now tonight we're going to look at okay how does that look in my life what does that practically mean for the Christian we're going to look here and we're going to read Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 and verse 23 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now I read that list of the fruits of the Holy Spirit and I pause in my mind and I think of everything I've seen on the TV this last six months. I see the... I see the, 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 the chaos I see the confusion I see the vitriol I see the division I see the anger and the hurt and the pain and I think to myself you know what's wrong with America there's a, a distinctive and there is a perceptible lack of the working of the Holy Spirit of God in Americans I can't honestly say in my lifetime I've never seen my country more divided. I've never seen my country more angry or more anxious or more upset. And, and, and Brother Rick, I just have to think to myself, you know what that is? It's not because there's no toilet paper on the shelves, although that will make you cranky. I'll, I'll give you an amen right there, all right? Listen. The great dearth in America is not toilet paper or toiletries. But the great thing that America is missing, you look at, you read that list, and you think of everything that ills America. There's nothing that the Holy Spirit of God couldn't fix in America. And we see that. We, we, we talked about the preeminence of love. Why would the very first thing that God would list would be love? We talked about that. You think about if there was genuine unselfish love that would spread across America tomorrow what would America look like that's the significance of why we're studying this tonight let's go to him in prayer Heavenly Father we come before you God I, I don't believe that there is a more important truth in the pages of your Bible Lord than the fruit of the Holy Spirit born through the life of your children and God I pray dear Lord we look at America Lord either with dismay or disgust instead of having a weeping and broken heart and saying God what would fix America is you Lord I pray that you would please move through me and move through your people Lord, I pray the answer to America's problems is not a political solution, but it is a spiritual solution. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be a part of that. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name, and amen. I don't want to spend too much time tonight. We've already done a little bit of review. I want to jump right into your notes for sake of time. The subject of love. Notice in your notes here, the subject of love. The, um, the, the subject of love is found, this is the first thing you want to write down, 328 times. The word, the phrase, the subject of love and loving is found 328 times just in your New Testament Bible. Can anybody say wow with me? Wow. I was amazed. That's one of the reasons I love being a pastor. I love being a pastor because I get to pray and I get to preach and I get to talk to people about Jesus everywhere. I get to act like a religious nut and they say, well, that's his job. Praise God. He's just one of those kind. That's right. I'm happy to be one of those kind of Christians. And I get paid to do it. Glory to God. It doesn't get any better than this. But every week I get to get in my Bible and I get to study. What a wonderful thing that is. 
And I get to find out things. I never knew that. I never knew that 328 times in the pages of just my New Testament, God talks to me about the subject of love and loving. That tells me, guess what? It's very, very important. Extremely important. Now, notice in your notes here, we are all capable of giving. That's the next thing. We are all capable of giving and receiving love at a human level. By the creation of God, we are endowed with uh, the human ability to do a couple things. Look, to show affection, uh, to empathy, and kindness at varying degrees. All right? There are some people that you meet and you can't even get a holy grunt out of them. All right? Uh, there are some other people that you meet are very kind and very affectionate. But all of us, because of the nature of God's creation and the image of God, we all have that ability to either to give affection, empathy, and kindness in different areas. Now, but I want you to notice that what we're talking about tonight, what we're studying from the Bible, is not natural. Okay, uh, so the, this is a natural love that is influenced by the flesh and fallen nature. That, that affection, that empathy, that kindness, those are all a natural love that is influenced by our flesh and fallen nature, which means our love, unlike God's, is both two things. Circle the word limited. Circle the it's limited. All right? And it's full of faults. I want you to circle that or highlight or underline it. Our love is human. It's limited, number one. And it's full of faults, number two. Listen, that's not the kind of love that God is talking about. That is not the kind of love that is uh, being described in the scriptures. Uh, Someone very wisely said this. Listen, it's very easy to love Jesus. Would you agree with that? It's very easy to love Jesus. It's a lot harder to love the people that Jesus loved. That takes grace. It's very easy to love Jesus. It's very easy to love your spouse on a good day. It's very easy to love your children when they're not driving you crazy. It's very easy to love your coworkers when they're not irritating you. Our love is limited and it's also full of faults. That's not the kind of love that the Holy Spirit bears in our lives. Now, next section. Very important to know. Love is a verb. All right. Now, I'm not an English, le- uh, English lecturer or an English major. In fact, I, won, I, won, I have won one award when it comes to English grammar. When I was in the sixth grade, I moved from a Christian school system to a public school system. And unfortunately, my school system focused on Christian and school. <laughs> and so when I got into the public school system, I tested very remedial in everything. And I had a very mean teacher. And uh, uh, she, anyway, uh, I, halfway through my sixth grade year, I believe her name was Mrs. Lentz. Mrs. Lentz probably departed by now. Uh, but Miss, Ms. Lentz or Mrs. Lentz, she made me come up in front of the whole class and she was presenting different awards and she handed me an award and made me hold it up and it said, the, the person who will never receive an award in English. That was the award she handed me in the sixth grade in front of the whole class. The person who will never receive an award in, in, in big letters, all right? Uh, later that day, I threw her cigarettes away, all right? <clears throat> she was a chain smoker and all her breaks. I had a bad day. She had a bad day. Anyway, uh, that's just, I'm glad I got saved after that, and I'm glad I got, I got put that under the blood. Uh, but so let me tell you something. She had a really bad day after that because I had a really bad day after that. And uh, I've been emotionally scarred and had to go through therapy and all kinds of stuff. But thank God for the healing power of Jesus. Now listen, I'm not an English major, but I do know what a verb is. A verb is an action. You say, what does that mean? Now, it, it, we perceive, look in your notes here, we perceive love, we perceive love as an emotion or a condition, right? I'm in love, or I love you. It's an emotion or condition. But God has revealed to us that his love, true love, it's two things. Number one, it's a choice. Love is a choice. True love, godly love is a choice. And... It is an action. And I notice I, I, I left out the word is just to prove that I'll never win an award. Mrs. Lentz, God bless her departed soul, was right. Love is a choice and love is an action. You say, back that up biblically, preacher. Well, I did. Look at your notes. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 in your notes. It says this, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but look in deed and in truth. Biblical love is always a choice and it's always an action. Let me give you the most famous verse in the Bible. Look at this in John three sixteen. For God, what? So what? Read that word. Loved the world. What did he do? That he gave his only begotten son. Listen. The love that God has for us 
listen, for us, to us, and through us. It's a choice and it's an action. It is not an emotion. My friends, our human flesh, our emotions will rise and fall. Our emotions will rise and fall, but God has called us to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, a love that does not wax and wane with feedback or appreciation or recognition. Aren't you glad that God's love for you doesn't get hotter and colder based on who you are and how you behave and what you do? God's love is always a consistent love. God's love is always a present love. God's love is always a loving love. It doesn't get hotter and colder based on our obedience or our reciprocation. That is the kind of love that the Holy Spirit wants to bear through us. Now, look at this next section here. The fruit of love. The fruit of love. How does God produce... uh, Flip your page over here. How does God produce the fruit of love in my life as a Christian? Number one. So we're going to answer the question. Okay, pastor, I understand what it is. I understand it's very important. So how do I, as a Christian, how does this happen in my life? How does the Holy Spirit produce love through me number one the holy spirit produces through fruit i'm sorry the fruit of love through abiding in christ go with me you don't have to hold your hand here we're, we're, we probably won't come back go with me to john chapter 15 john chapter 15 tonight john chapter 15 now first thing there are three truths i'm going to give you in this section it will not be long all right how does the holy spirit produce fruit spiritual fruit and specifically the fruit of love in my life number one through the it is produced through abiding in christ notice john 15 and jesus says i am the true vine and my father is the husbandman that means the the vine keeper or the vine tender every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That word clean means you've been purged, you've been pruned, your life has been cleaned up. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except uh, uh, it abide in the vine, No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Now, I know in our minds, we're we're very spatial people. We think God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's just how we think. Person, person, person. But God says that these three are, are one so the spirit of the father is also the spirit of christ they're they're one and i know it's hard to wrap our minds around it but but the spirit of god is the spirit of christ and as we abide in christ we abide in his spirit and as we abide in christ his spirit produces fruit to us and through us just like we then that's why god gives us these physical pictures we can all picture in our mind an apple tree or a in this particular context a grapevine and we can see the grapevine and we see the little branch and at the end of the branch we see the leaves and we see the grapes and we know instinctively that branch didn't produce that fruit but that branch is attached to the vine and that life-giving vine flowed through the branch and produced the fruit that's why God talks to us in pictures and symbols and illustration. We're like, oh, I get it. Now look at our notes here. The fruit of the Holy Spirit of God is produced from God. That's the next thing I'm going to write down. From God and through God. The Spirit of God is also the Spirit of Christ. These, these three are one and they work as one. Now you say, Pastor, what does it mean to abide in Christ? It's not some spookiness. To abide in Christ is to attach. Is to attach and remain attached to Jesus. It's like that branch. That branch gets, listen, 
when you look so close, you can see the branch and you see the vine, but there's a point of so closeness you can't tell the difference. Hey, is that the branch or is that the vine? You say, how close do you want to be to, to Jesus, Pastor? I want to be so close to Jesus that when you look real close in my life, sometimes it's really hard to tell. Hey, is that Rob Pofel or is that Jesus? That's abiding. To abide in Christ is to attach and remain attached to Jesus, just like a branch to a vine or tree. Listen, as a a grape branch cannot produce fruit of itself, we cannot either unless we abide in Jesus. Listen, get close to Jesus. That's what it's all about. Get close to Jesus. if, If I want to produce the spiritual fruit in my life, I need to abide in Christ. Number one. Number two. Number two. Spiritual fruit, number two, is produced through yielding. Go with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And look at verse 13. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. And Romans 6, 7, and 8 is really the seminal chapters of the Bible about understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and also the the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, Some very, very important uh, chapters. Look at Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 13. And I want you to keep mental note as we're reading. Look at the word yield and yielding here. Starting verse 13. Neither yield ye your members, that's your body, your mind and your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, your body, as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey... His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Listen, the second thing is this. How does the Christian produce the fruit of love? Number one, by abiding in Jesus. Jesus is love. And Jesus will produce a spiritual and a supernatural love fruit. He did it to you when you got saved. And as you draw close to him and he flows through you, He'll give you the ability to love the unlovely like he did. But number two, it comes through yielding to his spirit. It comes to yielding to God. Look at your notes here. Now, Jesus tells us in John 15 that as, he, as we abide in him, the Father purges, purges, that's the next word you want to write down there. It's a biblical word, our lives, or cleans away the unfruitful and unproductive parts of our lives. I've had the uh, uh, privilege of working around a few folks that uh, know a thing or two about uh, agriculture and farming and things like that. And uh, one of the things that uh, when I met my wife and that her family is big into gardening. And one of the things they would do, they, they, they grow some of the best tomato plants. But they would go out there and uh, there's tomato plants and, and they would uh, pick off what they would call all the suckers. Uh, so a, on a tomato plant, there's a bunch of little uh, sprouts, and leaf, uh, sprouts and stems and things like that. They weren't going to go anywhere. They weren't going to do anything. They weren't going to produce tomatoes. Uh, but they were a part that was pulling away life-giving nutrients from the thing. And they would go through there and they would pull every single one of those off. And at first I was like, what are you doing to that poor tomato plant? What did that tomato plant do to you? All right. But then they explained to me, listen, this strengthens the tomato plant. And what uh, the branches that are producing the tomatoes get all of the energy. Now listen, this is what God does to us. As we come to God and we say, God, I want to be more productive. God says, okay. And he begins to work on our life. And he begins to purge our life. You can read it in John 15. And he will begin to remove areas of our life that are life, uh, life, drawing life away but not producing fruit. Now it's not a pleasant process and it's not an enjoyable process, but it certainly is a productive process. Now, let's get back in our notes here. This is done, this purging, cleaning process, this is done through yielding to the truth in his word. All right, we see that in John 15, 3. Jesus said, now you're clean through the word, which I have spoken unto you. As you get into the Bible, God begins to address areas of our lives. And, number two, by yielding ourselves to his leading through his spirit. 
Let me give you a real life scenario. All right, you're in your car and you're going down in your car or, or you're at work. Okay, let's, 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 you're at work and somebody says something to you that's rather offensive and your flesh says, oh yeah. And the Holy Spirit says, ah, 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 ah. how many of you guys have ever had that happen to you? All right, the Holy Spirit says, now, 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 now. Now you and I have a choice. At that very moment, we have a choice who we are going to yield to. We are, listen, we're going to proceed, right? We're going to go on with the conversation. We're going to go on with that interaction. Now, husbands, it can be with your wives. Wives, it can be with your husbands. Moms and dads, it could be with your children. Could be with coworkers, could be anybody. Now, you and I, we've been in that situation and the flesh says retaliate. The flesh says, smart, I'm back. The flesh says, oh yeah. And the spirit says, turn the other cheek. The Spirit says, why don't you love them? Where Jesus said, why don't you bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You say, how do I do that? You yield to the Spirit. We talked about this at length in one of the first lessons. Listen, this is why we have to mind the Spirit. We have to be attuned to Him when He checks us and He's addressing us. Now, you're either going to respond, or I'm sorry, you're going to react in the flesh, or you're going to respond in the spirit. To yield, how did this Holy Spirit yields fruit in our lives? When we yield ourselves to the leading of the spirit. You know what that does? It, it, it shuts our mouths. It changes our, in fact, we'll get to the end of this. Mystery. Okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Listen, a little back to your notes here, and I got to wrap this up there. To yield is to grant permission to another. The Christian is not to choose their own path and plan. We are to yield to God's. This is walking in the Spirit. As I yield to the Spirit, His leading and His work in my life, and I do that time and time and time, step after step after step, if I yield to the Spirit, then I walk in the Spirit. Now, lastly, number three, how does the Spirit of God produce the fruit of love in my life? Number one, by me abiding in Christ. Number two, by me yielding to his, spirit, to his spirit. Number three actually is the product. So the first two are inputs. The third in your notes here is the product. The, the fruit of love is produced towards others. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 13. This is the last place we're going to go. You're in the book of Romans. Romans. You're in Romans. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse 4. So to clarify, how does the Spirit of God produce the fruit of love in my life? Number one, by abiding in Christ. Christ is love, and he gives love to us, and if we will allow him, he'll give love through us. Number two, it is by yielding to the Spirit and by having spiritual responses and reactions in our lives. And we do that decision after decision, encounter after encounter, and by doing that, we walk in the Spirit. Those are the two inputs. What's the output? What does this look like? All right? It looks like, and it, what it is, is love, the fruit of love, is produced towards others. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Now, in this chapter, the same word, charity, is our word agape, which other places are uh, translated love. God wanted to remove all doubt of what kind of love this is, so he chose the pure word, charity, to say, hey, guys, just in case you know, want to know, this isn't a, an affectionate, an occasional, a friendly love. This is a selfless love. This is the love that God has for you. And when we love as God loves, look at what happens in verse 4. Charity suffereth long. You know, the other word for that is long-suffering. Now, do you know what it means to be long-suffering? This is going to be deep, all right? I went to four years of Bible college to help you out with this. Long-suffering means to suffer a long time. <laughs> Y'all got that? All right. I had to look that up in seven translations. No, I'm just joking. The Bible says, charity, love, suffereth long. Now, everybody look up here. Does that sound like a good situation or a bad situation to you? Does that, does that sound pleasant? Does that sound enjoyable? No, it doesn't. What does love look like? Godly love. Look at, look at verse 4. Charity suffereth long. That means it's long-suffering. It takes, it takes a lot of beating. It takes a lot of abuse. And is kind. You know when you're kind? When other people are unkind to you. 
That's what love looked like. Love, godly love, suffers long. Think about this. Think about this. How long has God suffered with your bad attitudes and bad actions and hang-ups? That's what love looks like. How kind has God been to you and you didn't deserve that kindness? That's what godly love looks like. I'm painting a picture for you so we can all understand. The Holy Spirit produces the love of God through Christ and through yielding, but the fruit of the Spirit is for others. Think about this. This blew me away. One of those, wow, never thought of that. Do you know that a tree never eats its own fruit? I know that's deep, all right? That's deep. That's what your pastor stays up and thinks about late at night, all right? Do you know that a tree never eats its own fruit? The fruit is always enjoyed by another. And God calls these things the fruit of the Spirit produced in the life of the Christian. You know who those are to be enjoyed by? Others. Notice what the God says here. But charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Means that's not means it's a bragging. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things things that's what real godly love looks like let me let, let's go to your notes here and i got to wrap this up the fruit of love produced by god through the life of the christian is produced not for self satisfaction you know that's what we were always hung up on we always wanted to enjoy the fruit that the spirit of god produces in our life we wanted to enjoy it for ourselves god never meant the fruit produced in your life to be enjoyed by yourself it's to be in, produced through you for the enjoyment of others. It is not there for self-satisfaction, but for the benefit of others. And I made the little statement there, the fruit tree never eats its own fruit. The Holy Spirit produces love through us, enabling us to love others like God loves us. There are 14, the last thing I want you to write in there, there are 14 actions of love that when put together and that's in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, put together a, a picture the complete and enduring love that God has for us and that we can produce through him towards others that is why and how the Holy Spirit of God produces love in the life of the Christian now next week we'll come back and we're going to look at the second fruit of the Holy Spirit joy inner wonderful abiding joy it'll be right after the election i think it's a very timely topic one way or another it's going to be good let's pray heavenly father we come before you this evening and we ask dear lord please god we i do not believe these dear kind folks would be in church on a wednesday night when it's dark outside on a school night and a work night lord if they did not earnestly desire that you would work in and through their lives Father, there is no earthly reason that they would be here, dear Lord, if they did not desire that the work that God, that you would work in and through them to be what they want, you want them and want me and you want us to be. God, I pray. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make a difference. God, I pray that you would help us to make a difference in our homes through producing the fruit of love and kindness and charity to our spouses and to our children. And God, I pray, dear Lord, as we enter the workplace tomorrow and our co-workers, and Lord, as we go to the store and this, all the interactions we have, God, I pray, Lord, I pray that there would be a marked difference in the life of every Christian. God, is the love that you have given to us God, that you would produce through us. Lord, you loved us when we were unlovely. God, we recognize, Lord, it is only through you that we can love the unlovely. 
And God, we can love them like you love them. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make a difference through this kind of love. Lord, we acknowledge it's only through you. We ask for your help, Lord, in Jesus' name. And amen. If we'll stand this evening with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, musicians playing a verse of invitation softly. If the Spirit of the Lord has spoken to you about some area in your life, maybe.